as you heard, I'll be telling you a bit about my work uh, using the mouse to model cancer to understand cancer development and ultimately, hopefully, cancer treatment and prevention uh, in time. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be representing Class 4, and the new inductees in Class 4 are all shown here. Congratulations to all of them. I want to point out specifically Doug Hanahan, whose work I've followed very much in my career. Doug could have as easily given this talk with the same title. Um, and there, there are, in fact, a few other mouse modelers in the cancer field who will be inducted this year. And four of us got together last night, uh, hosted by Nancy Jenkins and Neil Copeland, who will be joining us this year as well at a wonderful restaurant. Uh, and this is a picture taken with my iPhone last night. Um, and these are the wines that were drunk by this group of individuals. Uh, so if I lapse into incoherence shortly, you'll understand why. Um, to give a bit of a background about cancer genetics, um, we now know after 30, 40 years of uh, intensive study in trying to understand the basis of uh, transformation of normal cells into cancer cells that the process is driven by alterations in cellular genes. And there are two broad classes of genes that are affected in cancer development, the so-called oncogenes, uh, and these genes act by um, driving the process of cell division forward. Um, they function normally when cells need to divide, uh, and in cancer they become perturbed and act ab apparently um, actively. These genes are opposed by a second class of genes called tumor suppressor genes, and the tumor suppressor genes act essentially as the brakes on the cell division process, um, stopping or halting cell division when it's appropriate to do so. Now in cancer, as I said, these genes get altered, and in the case of oncogenes, they get stuck on, they become constitutively activated and drive cells to divide at times and in places when they should not. And the tumor suppressor genes become inactivated in cancer development, such that when a cell should receive signals to stop dividing, or indeed to kill itself, um, those signals are not relayed and the cell continues to persist and ultimately develop into a full-scale tumor. I'll be telling you about um, work involving two very commonly affected oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, and those are KRAS and P53. KRAS in the oncogene class, which is mutated in about 30% of all human tumors. It's a very essential signaling molecule in cells and gets stuck essentially by a point mutation, which locks the protein in its active signaling state. And P53, which is a very commonly mutated tumor suppressor gene, mutated in about 50% of all human cancers. P53 responds to various forms of cellular stress uh, and instructs the cell to stop dividing in response to that stress to repair the damage uh, or else to kill itself. P53 is an essential component of many apoptosis pathways. Now, cancers arise from normal cells through the acquisition of multiple mutations in oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes and other genes, and much of the focus in the field for the last 30 to 40 years has been on the function of those genes in the context of individual cells. But we also know that cancer develops in a tissue in the body, and as such, it has very important interactions with normal cells that surround it, cells of the immune system, uh, stromal elements, the, bl the blood vessels, and even wild-type cells within a tissue can affect the growth and behavior of incipient cancer cells. Moreover, cancers typically don't stay where they start. They move in the process of metastasis, and in this fashion, they also interact with many other cells of the body. And so for this reason, um, Doug Hanahan, Neil Copeland, Nancy Jenkins, myself, and many others in the field have been studying cancer using mouse models of the disease. And we've followed um, on uh, the pioneering work of Palmiter and Brinster and Phil Leder and Rudy Anish and others who used the first uh, methods of genetic manipulation in the mouse to develop strains that were cancer prone uh, in order to do things that we can't do as easily uh, or at all in the context of human beings. Mice, as you know, are a very good model of uh, human biology. They are very similar genetically, um, but importantly, they are not identical. Uh, as this image illustrates, mice are not humans. Uh, there are differences, and we have to pay attention to those differences as, as we interpret the results from our mouse model studies and their application to our understanding of human cancer. But this slide also makes the important point that, not, not all, that humans are not identical either. We differ genetically, and those differences influence various features uh, of normal physiology, but also uh, tumor development. And this actually is an advantage of using the mouse, because we can control the genetic background of the mouse to make each animal in our colony essentially genet genetically identical. 
Uh, and this way we can grow up large numbers of animals, which differ only with respect to the tumors that are developing in them, and thereby isolate uh, specific differences involved in cancer biology. And again, we can do things in the context of these mouse models that are not practical or possible or, or ethical um, in the context of human beings. Now, I don't have time in this short presentation to tell you anything about uh, the details of how we make these mutant mice. Um, transgenic technologies, knockout technologies have been, have been developed over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. We mostly use in my laboratory gene targeting technology, which utilizes embryonic stem cells that are isolated from early mouse embryos, the blastocyst stage embryo. Embryonic stem cells, for those of you who don't know, are popularized recently by virtue of their utility in regenerative, uh, degenerative diseases. Um, but in the laboratory, we've been using mouse embryonic stem cells for uh, a very long time. We can take the cells out, manipulate them in the lab by altering their genes, and then we can return the cells, the manipulated cells, the mutant cells, to a normal blastocyst stage embryo, and that animal, uh, that embryo, will develop to term and result into a chimeric mouse, as shown here, and we can tell chimeras based on the different coat colors. The coats uh, differ by virtue of the fact that the host embryo would have given a mouse that is black in this instance. The embryonic stem cells were derived from a mouse that would have been brown or agouti, and the chimera is composed of the descendants of both types of cells. Because we've manipulated the cells in the laboratory, some of the descendants of the, quote, brown cells carry the mutation, and we can then breed those animals and pass the mutation on to a whole generation of mice, and thereby study the consequences that, of that mutation in the whole animal. We and others use um, now many, many, there are hundreds and hundreds of genetically manipulated mice of this sort that uh, develop cancer by virtue of the mutations that we've introduced into the germline. And much of the work in the field um, studies the process that unfolds from cells that are initiated by these mutations to a full-scale tumor has developed. Uh, and uh, I think Doug Hanahan has actually done the most extensive work in this field using this type of model to understand the fine details from initiation through progression to metastasis. And we can learn a lot of cancer biology, and we have learned a lot of cancer biology by dissecting what these different arrows mean. In addition, these mice are becoming increasingly useful for practical applications. Once you have a faithful model of human cancer, you can use it to study new therapeutics, early detection strategies, or indeed, ultimately, chemo prevention. Uh, and again, we're finding a greater degree of adoption of these models, not just in academia, uh, but also in industry. Now, my laboratory is focused on uh, many types of cancer, but primarily lung cancer. And lung cancer, as I think you probably all know, is the major form of uh, cancer killer in this country and around the world. There are about 160,000 deaths in, from lung cancer in the United States each year and more than a million worldwide. And unfortunately, um, cancer uh, cure rates are, are minimal, especially with advanced disease. Um, individuals have an average five-year survival of about 15 percent uh, post-diagnosis. And this is due in part to the fact that tumors are often diagnosed way too late, once they've spread beyond the lungs uh, in the form of metastasis. And this is illustrated here. Uh, for patients who have distant metastases at the time of diagnosis, which now represents more than 50 percent of all patients, the five-year survival rate is about 3 percent. So there's a clear need to do more here, um, both to develop new medicines uh, to treat advanced cancers, but also to understand the process of cancer development so that we can either detect it earlier or block this from happening. Again, I don't have a lot of time to go through the details of the kinds of strains that we use, but I will tell you three short stories related to basically a pair of strains that we've constructed, including the one shown here, which has an alteration in this gene I mentioned earlier called KRAS. It's a very important human oncogene and mutated in about 30 percent of human lung cancers, of the non-small cell lung cancer variety. And what we've done is to introduce a mutation in the gene that activates it, but we've also introduced a transcriptional stop element, shown here, which blocks the expression of the gene. Therefore, the gene is present in the germline, but it's not active. The mutation is not felt by those cells by virtue of that transcriptional stop element that we've engineered in next door. However, the stop element is surrounded by short sequences called LOXP sites, such that in the presence of an enzyme called CRE, um, the LOXP sites get removed and the gene turns on. And this gives us great flexibility to study the consequences of RAS activation where and when we want to see it. And in the lung, lung cancer models, we, we use inhalation of the virus, of a virus, sorry, carrying Cree recombinase. Inhalation of the virus, the cells in the lung get infected by the virus carrying Cree. Stop element gets removed. The RAS gene turns on, and then stuff happens. 
Uh, and this gives you an illustration of what happens. Um, we find early on following RAS activation, hyperplasias. This is a tissue section, and you can see a thickening right here. T too many cells that uh, should be a normal single cell layer now building up on, upon one another. This is called hyperplasia. These lesions will give rise to solid masses called adenomas, benign tumors, which can progress to adenocarcinomas in time. We've done a lot of work over the years trying to figure out <clears throat> the step even before this step, and I won't go through this, but we have evidence that a tissue stem cell is the cell of origin of this cancer, and there's a lot of interest in stem cells and cancer these days. And we've also looked at the end of the process. Following advanced adenomas in the lung, we can also drive metastasis formation using um, a combination of RAS mutation with a P53 mutation. And these two mutations together collaborate to allow the tumors to progress to the point that they metastasize. And we're doing a lot of work in my lab these days trying to study the detailed mechanisms of metastasis. Ultimately, we want to understand what all these arrows mean in molecular detail, uh, and we're using all sorts of molecular technologies to try to understand that. So let me now tell you briefly um, a few short stories. Um, the first has to do with using these models to try to understand the consequences of manipulating these cancer genes in the context of an, of an evolving tumor. The first was motivated by the success in developing drugs against the oncogenes that I've mentioned, and there are many examples emerging now of very specific targeted agents that counteract the consequences of mutations in genes like HER2 nu uh, or the EGF receptor, and the drugs are shown here. We asked the question, are the tumor suppressor genes likewise important in the fully advanced tumor? In other words, is the inactivation of a tumor suppressor gene required for the biology of the, of the advanced tumor? And the way we did that was to use genetic engineering again to construct a P53 allele, this is that tumor suppressor gene that I mentioned, which is off in the germline configuration, the policeman is no longer on the beat, but Using the same locks stop locks strategy in the combination with Cree recombinase, we can activate the gene and allow the P53 to be uh, functional again, to bring it back to life in the consequence of an established tumor. And so David Felzer in the lab used this strategy to bring together a mutant P53 allele that's activatable with a mutant RAS allele, not the one I mentioned before, but a similar one, um, in an animal that allowed us to activate the gene. And so he um, activated Cree and turned on P53 in fully established tumors, um, and we saw very striking results. Um, this is uh, images from a section as well as micro CT images that allow us to follow tumor development over time. And what we observe is that indeed, <clears throat> when we activate P53 here, um, tumors stop growing and actually start to regress. So the fully established tumor really does care if P53 is missing or present. Um, and this is also seen histologically. This is what would, one would see if one were looking at a tumor lacking P53. It's a juicy tumor full of nasty cancer cells. But if you turn P53 back on, you see big holes developing. Uh, and that's because P53 is acting to eliminate those cells, either by, by cell cycle arrest and senescence and removal of those senescent cells or by apoptosis. We're still working that out. But this does suggest to us that indeed it would be therapeutically useful to try to trigger P53 function in tumor cells that lack it. And many groups, including ours, are trying to do exactly that. Moving on, we're also considering pathways that are activated uh, in response to RAS activation. RAS itself is quite difficult to drug, so we've been looking for pathways that get activated in response to RAS. Uh, and Etienne Melan, a postdoc in my lab, has recently demonstrated that the NF-kappa B pathway is hyperactive in these tumors as well as in certain human tumors. Um, and so using this genetic model, he asked the question, if we inhibit NF-kappa B function, a very important signaling function involved in um, cell survival and inflammation and other important processes, um, using a genetic trick by expressing an inhibitor of NF-kappa B activation, so-called I-kappa B super repressor, in developing tumors, what would happen? Uh, and again, it was quite dramatic. If you don't express this inhibitor of the NF-kappa B pathway, you develop tumors, as we would expect. But if you, if you express the inhibitor of NF-kappa B, uh, now we see a very dramatic in, uh, decrease in tumor development. And now we and others are focusing a lot of attention on this pathway as a poss possible route to therapy um, for lung cancers that have RAS mutation, possibly P53 mutation as well, that have evidence for NF-kappa B pathway activation. Now, in the last minute or so, I'll tell you just one last 
short story. For those of you who are not, are not, are not in this field or follow the fields closely, um, molecular technologies are extremely important these days. Um, using gene expression arrays like the one shown here, one can assess the function of essentially all genes in a tissue sample, a normal or tumor. Uh, look at the activity state of thousands of genes simultaneously, as was done here, where blue and red are indications of levels of expression, low and high. And we can therefore determine whether uh, tumors and normal tissue differ um, in crit critical pathways. This is used for lots of different reasons in the field. But in this case, we decided to look for whether there were markers that we could image as, as possible routes to early detection for lung cancer. And David Kirsch in my lab, working with Ralph Weiss later, in fact found that there were enzymes in the cathepsin class that were upregulated in lung cancers compared to normal lung. And we focused on the cathepsins because Weisslater's lab had actually developed chemical probes that could be activated by cathepsin activity. These probes were inactive in the native state because of quenching, but when released from their scaffold by cathepsin enzymes, they began, they, they were freed and could be, uh, could be fluorescent. And so we decided to test this in our mouse model of lung cancer. And working with Ralph's lab, we showed, in fact, that in contrast to um, animals lacking tumors, which had a very dim signal with this probe that had been, inject had been injected 24 hours previously, animals with lung cancer had very substantial signal. And these lesions are one millimeter in size. Um, and I point out that we didn't do anything th to these tumors to make them glow. This is taking advantage of a biochemical alteration that naturally arises during tumor development. Now, I actually don't know whether this particular probe or even this target is going to be useful ultimately in early detection and diagnosis of lung cancer and other cancers, but this strategy certainly will be. And this, this experiment provides proof of principle for that uh, process. So I've gone over time, and I'll just end by reminding you that uh, the mouse models that we and many of us have created over the years have great utility in helping us understand the processes that go wrong during tumor development and give us tools to ultimately figure out better ways to control cancer. And I'll stop there and just show the names of the folks who've participated in this work um, and uh, happily answer some questions. Thanks very much.